Uh, I believe you can take either of them out. Okay. I'll let that one for Rob. I'll take the other one. All right. He, he just stands. All right. Yeah, he's pretty good. All right. I'm the bad one who wanders around. Okay. Did that work for you? Yeah, no problem. <laughs> One got it. So make sure I say yeah, you occur and yes, for sure. And you shall look at the fucking job. Yeah. Right. So I didn't see Oh, Heidi Beargrave, you're here. I see you. <laughs> Mr. Lackmission. Okay. Yeah. I might do a better job of just Okay.
It's super bright. That's why I'm looking at this one. I always I struggle with it being lighting. Lighting, I think the ones having to go down. Yeah. It's bad. Yeah. I guess I don't know how to be on the percent. Are you definite? Did the elevator work? Yes. I visually inspect it. I appreciate it. <laughs> It's nice that you have your own, but it worked pretty well last night. They were right on cue with you yeah, they last night. That was impressive. They picked up right away. They did. Yeah, that was nice. <laughs> All right, I think I'm going to. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming out on this chilly evening, and thank you for those who are watching online. My name is uh, Dr. Paul Gordon. I'm honored to serve as the superintendent of D303. Again, welcome to our boundary session uh, meeting tonight. With me, I've got Robert Schwartz from RSP and Associates. He'll be doing the vast majority of this presentation. He will walk you through the decision-making tree. He will walk you through different scenarios. And from there, we will exit out more likely this side. Um, and we'll be able to go in and see the different scenarios with different maps. Uh, but again, thank you for coming out tonight. We have our board here with us as well. They will also be circulating around uh, at the maps, uh, listening in, engaging in different conversations. Uh, We've got our board president, Ms. Heidi Fairgreave. We've got Mr. Joe Lackner. Uh, we've got Mr. Ed McNally. We've got Mr. Thomas Lentz here. We've got Ms. Kate Bell here, Ms. Becky McCabe there. I believe Mr. Matt Kushert is here or will be here in a moment. Uh, but they will be around uh, at the different uh, boards as we exit out of this area. The boundary process has been a process that began last year. The board charged the administration to begin looking at our boundaries as we have some fairly significant overcrowding, especially at our elementary schools. For those who are in the uh, the Fearson, the Koran, uh, the Munn Hall, and others, you know there's some pretty significant overcrowding. We've had to deal with what we call cap and send, where families move into some of our neighborhood schools. And unfortunately, we're at uh, overcrowded and we're having to have families move to a different school. The board uh, was very clear with me and my team of, we need to figure this out. Um, we engaged RSP and associates who work directly with schools across the country to support us in finding a good solution for this. And you'll see those later uh, this evening. Part of that solution was looking at our facilities. The board made a decision to repurpose Lincoln Elementary, repurpose Fox Ridge Elementary, or Early Childhood Center and turning it into an elementary, uh, repurposing parts of Haines Center for the EC, so all those pieces play into how do we create more balance in each of our schools. Um, but it also impacts our middle schools and high schools. Again, uh, Rob will walk you through that. So I'm going to hand it over to him. He'll walk you through the process and then I'll finish up uh, as we get ready to close out the evening. Rob, back to you or to you. All right. Good evening again, Rob Schwartz uh, with RSP. Um, when I came in um, yesterday, I was uh, asked if being from Keene City, if I like the Chiefs, and I said no. I'm actually a Green Bay Packer fan, so I get behind this. But I grew up in Milwaukee, so there you go. Um, 
So let's get things um, started this evening. So what I'm going to talk to you about tonight is going to be some of the things that kind of set the storyline arc of why we need to do what's being proposed tonight. Um, and when I say doing something, a variant potentially of what we're going to show you in the concepts. So I'm going to get into the process, to some of the data that is the building block to be able to talk about some of this. And then we're going to release you into a venue where you can talk in small groups about what the options concepts are. And then you'll have the ability through our survey to provide your feedback. Everything we want to funnel it through the survey while you're in those groups, administration will be there. Myself will float between the groups. So we'll try to answer your questions, but the whole focus is to get your feedback in those surveys. So when we started out in this um, particular process, you'll see it's not something that just started yesterday. It's been in the works for quite a bit of time. And actually, even before the September uh, 25th, 2023, um, prior to that, we did an enrollment analysis and we audited your buildings to create a capacity, a functional capacity for all your buildings. We knew that needed to be done because if we have to change boundaries, we need to make sure we have the right space for the kids. So I'm showing you this because we're at the most important part of this process. And that was what happened last night, what's happening tonight, and then what's happening in this MetroQuest survey that will be open through December 10th. And that's hearing your feedback for those of you that are in person here and those that are viewing this online. We really do want to hear what your thoughts are. I can tell you, even though we've driven through your district, um, we've had conversations with different people to understand developments, we've looked at your data, there's some things you all will be able to provide in this process from last night, tonight, and on through December 10th that will be of value. I fully expect these drafts to change. We have guiding principles that we worked with the Board of Education to create. This is the framework. Um, like I said last night, it's kind of like when you take your kids to go bowling and you raise up the, the bumpers so that they're always going to hit a pin. This is something that we will then be able to deliver to the board um, within the metrics of what they were thinking when this process started. So a few of the things that I will bring to your attention on this bulleted list is First off, this is a long range plan in the sense that the goal is that we're not going to have to change boundaries anytime soon. Um, we don't want to go through this again. I know you all don't as well. We also wanted to make sure that we're utilizing efficiently the resources that are available to the district. And we know that the foundation of how we create these attendance areas are your neighborhoods. So the single family homes, the apartments, duplexes, all that build into the creation of a attendance boundary. We also wanted to focus that all changes could happen at each grade level, not just elementary, could be middle school, high school. You'll see that happen in these boundaries. Um, we also wanted to follow some of the natural things in your district that might be natural features like the river, could be mainly features like the roads, the actual developments. And we also know that there's some transportation challenges. And so we want to make sure that when we talk about busing, I'm making sure that we have the right attendance areas that will support what needs to happen with busing and not create more hazardous areas than we already have in that ability of pick up and drop off. The last bullet point on here is about grandfathering and student options. That's something that when you look at the numbers that I'm going to show you tonight, there's no options, there's no grandfathering in this. This is something that if that will happen, will be a recommendation from administration to the Board of Education. So know that that's, that's something that's still um, in discussion and it is important as we talk about if let's say there's a high school change, would that um, current junior, would they be able to finish out as a senior in that school? So those are the things that you get into when we have student options and grandfathering. We also cr created with the board um, through assistance with administration, a prioritization of criteria. So this is how we would evaluate any concept that we've created and how we would evaluate the two concepts that are being presented to you this evening. And it was developed where there's a primary and a secondary um, 
prioritization of criteria. So let me let me go through each of these so you understand how this comes into play. So with the primary boundary criteria, the number one was projected enrollment and building utilization. And this is just matching the enrollment to what the capacity is in those buildings for the programs that are being served in each of those buildings. Number two, demographic considerations was trying to have a balance in the buildings that would be somewhat uniform in each of the buildings you go to. It's not always possible with where we have different housing, where our buildings are, and how you create those zones. But again, one of the goals. Duration of boundaries, having them last as long as possible. So again, having the right number of kids associated in each of these attendance areas. Number four was fiscal consideration with capital costs. So being responsible with the dollars that they spend, that we wouldn't create a plan that would result in them having to do additional brick and mortar costs. The fifth criteria was neighborhoods and planning areas. So this can get a little bit convoluted when you think about where you live. And I refer to it as kind of the spaghetti of roads as you are moving between the major arterial roads. Sometimes it gets lost that you've moved from one subdivision to another subdivision. So taking those planning areas and assigning them completely to an elementary, a middle school, and a high school. So that was our primary boundary criteria. We had secondary boundary criteria where we had feeder systems. And that is ideally we would have an elementary completely go to a middle school and then on into a high school. Um, that's not really possible here in this district um, in that sense. But again, that would be a goal to try to do that. Students impacted by a boundary change. Um, this would be where we try to minimize the disruption of students. And we would know the number of students that are being disrupted because everything's built back to those planning areas where a student actually is residing. The next criteria was transportation considerations. So trying to make the situation potentially better for how students get to school and leave school, whatever the mode of transportation is, whether it's walking, on bikes, in a car, or even on a bus. The next one was physical consideration, operational costs. So this is staffing. We don't want to create a plan that we have to hire more staff. Um, that's counterintuitive to what the situation is for our budgets. And the next item was contiguous attendance areas. So keeping things compact. So visually, when you look at a map, does it make sense? Sometimes that it doesn't make sense with how we have to create things um, with like islands. You already currently have an island um, when we get to the middle school um, attendance boundaries. But those were the criteria that we established to look at. There was primary, there's secondary, they're all important. They all fall into how we look at what a plan might be for you um, for the next school year. So then our next item that we had was really some, some target or objectives. And so the first one was we're transitioning all of the elementary buildings to be K-5 facilities. And meaning that Davis and Richmond would not be paired schools of K-2, 3, 5. Um, we'd have all K-5 buildings. We would use Lincoln Elementary for other district need. Um, one primarily being the learning and teaching and transition is relocated there. And obviously they would not have an attendance area because they wouldn't be serving um, any elementary kids with uh, the way we're defining the boundaries. We'd have Fox Ridge transitions to a K-5 building. Um, the early childhood that's there would be relocated to Haines. And of course, we would have an attendance area that you'll see in those maps. The next larger item is the dual language programming would all be at Richmond Elementary. And there would be two sections of that per grade. Um, the goal being that dual language, the way it is being implemented today will be very different in five years with some of the ideas that the district has with how the dual language could provide opportunities um, for other students um, that are English speaking. So those were the guiding principles, the criteria, and some of the targets. So a little back end information of how, how did we get here? How is it that RSP can say, this is the way the future may look with what these concepts are going to um, be discussed later. It started with how we identified the data. And so there's these planning areas. And so this visual shows you planning areas. There's a green line that's represented for the planning areas. The dots represent when the units were built. Everything that we've gathered um, in your district, whether it was um, state level data, K-5 
county data, city data, or even the school student data all goes back to these planning areas. And why when you see this formula, everything is um, pushed into a statistical forecast model where we're looking at all of these different data sets to be able to say any particular area, is it increasing, remaining the same, or decreasing at any of the specific grades? We started to look further into what the enrollment is by grade to get a sense of how is enrollment changing over time here. And so one of the things that started to stand out was when we looked at your senior class, it typically is larger than the following year's incoming kindergarten class. That starts to point to a potential decrease. But as you look at year to year, there's cohort increases. So as you go from first to second or third to fourth, um, we start to increase in the number of students, which gets at why the grades when we get to high school are a little bit larger than what they are in the elementary. We even looked at the out-of-district students to understand how are they coming into to your community. And we know some of the districts we work with just east of here, um, it's quite a bit radically different um, based on some different things that are happening in those districts. So we knew we have to start looking at this because this is something that's, that's changing um, from what it was even five years ago. We also looked at live birth data, and here we're showing you the Kane County live birth. I just want to highlight a couple of things on the slide. When you go to the second column, you look at the number of live births that have happened in Kane County, and you can see we were at 8,400 births there in 2007. And you can see down here in 2021, the latest data that we could compile, we're at 5,600. So the live births have decreased. This is starting to be one of those reasons why we see a smaller kindergarten class. When you go to the last two columns, we're trying to get at what your potential market share might be when we're looking at those green and orange shaded areas. This starts to set the table of how many future kindergartners could we have, knowing that not everybody that was born five years ago still lives here in King County for this data set, or that everybody that was born in that year will be eligible to be kindergarten five years later, right? If they're born in October, November, December, they're not kindergartners. We also looked at migration of students, and this was really big in what's happening with your enrollment change over time. So the green parts of the bars represent students that were receiving services the previous year. And then in the year that we're showing here, we're showing you three years at each level, elementary, middle school, and high school, these students were no longer in the district. The orange part of the bars are students that are new to the district in that year. And so when we go down to those three bullet points, the great news is it's a positive number, but you can see that the last two years are much lower than what it was three years ago. Some of that is the pandemic residual uh, coming out of the 2020 year of why that bump was so much greater. But again, this is something that we're looking at because there's quite a few students that are new and there's quite a few students that are no longer receiving services. We also looked at the development in your community. And what I wanna highlight with you, what you see on this particular bar graph is the start of each decade is the red part of the bar. And what was built during that decade is the blue portion. The last bar is just the last two years. So it's not a complete decade. But you can see the greater amount of development occurred in the 80s, the 90s, and the first decade of 2000. Um, we're not gonna see that type of residential growth. I mean, your community is pretty mature as far as where we can see building activity. That was evident in the conversations that we've had, the, the tour that I have done of your district and where we created this map of where we potentially could see new development. So the green areas represent where we think something could happen, either it's happening now or should be happening in the next few years. And then as we get to yellow, closer to five years, there's not a whole lot of new development opportunities that we see at this point. All of that lent itself to be able to say, what is our enrollment forecast? And so we show you where you were. So when we go back to um, 2012, 2013, you see we had about 13,000 students. And then here um, this year, we're at about 11,300 students. So over the last 10 years, we've declined in what our enrollment is. There's a bar there, a black line that illustrates where we are and where we could be going. This visual, the red represents the elementary enrollments, the blue, the middle school, 
and the green, the high school. And so we show that there's going to be probably a, a stable enrollments in your district. There's going to be some challenges, some things that the district knows we have to watch. Live births, migration are the are the two big items because um, they're going to indicate what happens. Now we're just doing this. You can ask us, keep your questions for in the group for sure. Um, so then um, one more done presenting here with the presentation. Um, so then after we did the projections, I mentioned that we have um, a capacity um, forecast of what happens in your buildings. So here's a simple breakdown of what the goals the district has for each of the buildings. So three section buildings, meaning that there's three homeroom teachers in the elementary building at kindergarten, first grade, all the way through fifth grade. Number of classrooms that are available there. If you do three times six, you get 18 classrooms, right? Um, this means that the difference in these classrooms and those that are homeroom classrooms um, are what we would call flex space, where we could have four sections or there could be other homerooms there. So what we wanted to identify is what we can get for the number of students in each of these buildings. So this is how we developed what that capacity is. So this is the framework of how we can match up enrollments with the capacity in each of these buildings. We then have some visuals that get at what your current situation is. So current boundaries, so on this map, solid colors represent the colors that are in each of the elementary buildings. And then we have a heat map of the students where they reside in 23-24. And so the red areas represent the greatest density of students. And so you can see where those clusters are. This is important as we start to look at how much can you take from something that's near an elementary building when we have a lot of students, like around Koran, um, we can't really dig in without making it look unrealistic of how that boundary might be. We also have our current middle school boundaries. So again, the solid colors represent, if you remember, I said there's like an island. So the Koran piece that's in orange, um, it's an island. It's not connected. So it may visually not look like it makes any sense. We also have the high school boundaries. So again, the two different colors for each of those buildings. And then here's where we start right setting you with what our current situation is. So the numbers you will see in this table, there's a list of each of the buildings. The color represents what it would be in the map. You have the building capacities for each of those buildings. And then you have what the enrollment projections would be in the current situation. The last columns get at that utilization where you see orange. That means it's over 100% of the capacity of those buildings. And where there's green, it's under 70%. So we clearly have some buildings that are overutilized and some that are underutilized. And so this starts the conversation that, hey, we may need to have some elementary um, changes. Towards the bottom, you see the middle school and the high school. So again, the same situation, what I brought out last night, um, same thing tonight with middle school, we're really tight. We're basically district-wide almost at 100%. So this is why when you look at the current situation or you look at any of the concepts, sometimes it might get to 102% in one building or 105%. Very difficult to, to, to fine tune that with us being so close to what the middle school capacities are in the buildings. We also have the current demographics. So you can see the breakdown, whether it's the elementary buildings or the secondary buildings with the ethnicity. And then there's tables that are to the right of that that get into the free and reduced lunch totals that we currently have. So you get a sense of what our current situation is. We then have our current feeder. And so what you visually are seeing here is when we think about the existing elementary attendance areas, how do they feed to the middle school is the first diagram in colors. And so when we look at Coron, Lincoln, and Wild Rose, you can see that they are split between Thompson and Redland. When we look at those same elementary attendance boundaries as they feed into the high school, you can see that Bell Graham, Furson Creek, Wasco, and Wild Rose are split between the two high schools. 
So this is where we have a split feeder. You can see the percentage of those students broken out on those bottom tables in that category to see how that split impacts the number of students. And then what we've illustrated on this map is some of the challenges. So where you see a red exclamation point, that's where we're over capacity in those buildings. And where we see the blue circles, um, that's where we have available capacity. So what I wanted you to see with this visual is we have buildings that are in the south that we can put more students in and buildings in the north where there's too many students. So the natural flow of kids is gonna be the boundaries in the south have to expand north to be able to um, take on the students that we have too many of in some of those buildings in the north. So that's the visual there. So that was kind of the background of how we started to create and think about the concepts. And so what I'm gonna talk you through here over the next few minutes are each of these two concepts. The first thing that I want you to look at when you see this map, if you go to the top left-hand side, you see your district logo. There's five letters underneath that district logo. Draft, I wanna say that very loudly, draft. Um, your comments from last night, your comments tonight may change what you see in either of these concepts. You also will notice on this map, the solid colors will represent what's being proposed for the boundaries that would take place in the 24-25 school year. There are dotted lines on this map that represent the current attendance boundary lines. This is so you can visualize where it was and where it would be proposed to be in each of these concepts. What you'll notice in this concept one, we also put some takeaways up in the top right. And you'll notice what those are as it relates to who we're serving. Remember, we're going to all K-5 buildings. Um, we've also noted where things got reduced with enrollment to bring them within capacity guidelines. And then we've also mentioned, since this is an elementary map, that Richmond Elementary is where the dual language program is going to be housed. You'll see the same thing for the middle schools. And you'll see that there was a different distribution of students with Redling and Thompson. And that um, we have... In concept one, and I'll come back to the feeder because I think when you visually see what this is, it'll make a lot more sense than that bullet point, but we have a better system of a complete feeder. We then have a high school map, and this high school map is conforming to what we're making for changes at the elementary level that start to impact what you see at the high school. We then get into the projection. So what, what does this all mean with this concept? So when you look at how this plays out in um, 24, 25, you can see there's a couple areas where we're just a little bit over utilization. Um, one at Belgram in year one, and then in year five at Coron. And then you can see when we come down to Richmond Elementary, um, we're underutilized. The goal with Richmond, the dual language is there, is that we grow that program um, to be different than what it is now. It would offer opportunities. Remember, I said this earlier, for English-speaking students to be in this dual language program. So that's the situation with numbers. We, we improve from what it was before. When you go down to the secondary, I already indicated at the middle school, it's very difficult. We have a very thin line between space at both of those buildings to get it to match up where they're both at, let's say, 99%. Then we do it in one of the concepts. That's the numbers. We also have the breakdown of what it means for demographics. And the quick takeaway in this demographics is how this relates to change from what it currently is. Where there's a green shading, there's only one of them, it was lowered by more than 5%. And where it's orange, it was increased by more than 5%. So basically the buildings are fairly similar to what um, they currently are. We also show that for the free and reduced lunch. This next table gets at the secondary buildings. And so you can see how that looks um, with the ethnicity and with the free and reduced lunch. So again, very similar to what we see. So I said I'd come back to the feeder so that you'd understand this. So in this particular concept, all but Wild Rose 
we would see the elementaries completely feeding into a middle school or that elementary boundary completely feeding into the high school. And that's why we had that change with the Bell Graham area to be able to say, other than Wild Rose, um, everything fits within the context of completely elementary to middle or elementary to high school. And again, you can see that percentage breakdown for what that looks like with the 23, 24 students. So that was concept one. And again, the idea behind that was trying to move towards uh, having more of a complete feeder as well as all of the primary um, distribution of students. Again, we have the elementary plan and you can see the dotted lines, the current boundary, solid colors, the proposed boundary in this concept. Again, draft, you notice that every single map draft. You see the middle school. Some of the comments we heard last night was this visually looked better. Maybe they didn't like what it actually did, but visually it, two pieces, right? There was no island. And then when we get to the high school, um, the high school boundary remained the same. If we change the high school boundary in concept two, we could make the feeder look better. And I'll show you that here in a few moments. We then have the projections in very similar to what was in concept one. Um, there's a couple buildings though that we have some utilization challenges. And one of the big questions with um, Mun Hall was how far west do we come with Mun Hall? Because um, we could put more kids in there, um, particularly when we see that that utilization in concept two is under 70%. You can also see the um, breakdown for the secondary buildings. And then you also are able to see our demographics. Again, very similar. Not much difference when we come to the demographics of where it was and where it would be in either concept one or concept two. And the same thing with the secondary demographics and the free and reduced lunch. And then here's the feeder. This is where I was telling you where it's not as complete as concept one. And so we have breaks for Munhall and Wild Rose to Thompson and Redling. And then we have Bell Graham, Munhall and Richmond that are broken between east and north. So let me just kind of give you a quick breakdown in the next 60 seconds of what you're seeing in the elementary, middle school, and high school. So here we showed both concept one and concept two by each other. You'll be able to do this same thing when you're out at the larger maps. Which one focuses on how better utilization can happen in your district? And so we have these bullet points out to the right that I just want to kind of touch upon that will help us in your comments. The first is, when we're looking at Richmond Elementary, how far north can it go? Is, is, there, is there a breaking point where you get too close to Wild Rose and so that's too close? The next thing is how far can Mun Hall Elementary extend to the west? Or maybe you think it should go further north. And then we also want you to be thinking about how either of these plans better address neighborhood connectivity, transportation, or student enrollments. Those are the driving forces. We want to make sure we have the right enrollment in each of these buildings. When we get to the middle school, it's which impact is best desired. There's more students that are impacted in an option where um, we're eliminating the island and we're extending things, right? So we want to know wh which one fits better with how you are getting to work or getting to the schools with the transportation network? What does it mean with the enrollment, the neighborhood connectivity? And is there a desire to improve what that transition is from elementary to middle school? Do we need to have something that is more complete? Because clearly concept one has a more complete feeder from elementary to middle school. When we look at the high school, again, the, which, which do we like? Is it keeping it the way it is, or is it moving towards more of a complete feeder? But again, tying back to the neighborhood connectivity, the transportation network, and the student enrollments. So the last slide before we release you to, to have your discussion. What we try to establish on this slide is when we're looking at these metrics, how can you understand, is it meeting, is it falling short, or is there more work to be done? 
And so we have them listed off the projected enrollment building utilization. You'll see the current situation. You'll see what's in concept one and you'll see what's in concept two. Normally we would, and when I say we RSP, we would circle which one is maybe better than the other. There's such a slight difference between most of these criteria as you look between concept one and two from numbers, the statistics, we didn't circle any of these. How they impact you is going to probably influence whether you like concept one or concept two or propose some sort of variant to either of those concepts. You'll see the same thing for demographic considerations, the duration of boundaries, the feeder system, and then, of course, the fiscal consideration capital and neighborhoods intact. Really, the main differences in this proposal comes to whether you're thinking about the value of a feeder system. And that's why I've kind of mentioned that quite a few times when I'm talking about concept one or concept two. Is that a value that's worth making some of the changes, whether it's at the high school level, the middle school level, or even down into the elementary? So what you are going to see when um, you get your survey, there is a QR code that at any time you can click it and you can go into it. There's five pages in this survey, and each of these pages um, will give you some sort of introduction and some guidance on what you've heard tonight, but what we're trying to get from you as far as input that will help us in knowing, are there some changes that can be made? There's also on each of these pages, a place where you can kind of ad lib and put your thoughts in. It's limited to 250 characters, so be concise with what you put in there. If you need more than 250 characters, you have the ability to email the board members or um, Dr. Gordon um, to give more of a detail. Sometimes I think we've even gotten some with some, some pictures or different things of what they're concerned about on what this boundary plan may do for them. Please do that. This, this survey tool is just to get us the ability to know, hey, are we hitting some metrics and where is it falling short to be able to make some changes? We do want you to put all of your input into that survey. And that leads us to kind of our next step. Um, a, you don't get to listen to me anymore, but B, you can talk in your small groups about what you're seeing in these concepts and the conversations that you have. Um, I know from last night was really awesome to go around and, and be hearing what people have and what their concerns were and questions. If when I'm going around, there's questions you have, I'll try to answer them. And I know administration, when it gets into things with programming or whatnot, they're going to try to answer those too. The goal is push your information to the survey. Um, I can't say that enough. We've been doing this type of survey really since the pandemic started. And this has been such a valuable tool. And I can tell you that the concepts that you see tonight are likely to morph because of your inputs. And I know there's a little bit of trust that you have to have there. Um, not making promises, they change immensely toward what you may want, but there's going to be some changes just based on what's going to work for your community more than just the data that we've looked at. And so, Dr. Gordon, is there anything more you want to say? Rob, thank you so much. To our friends who are online, please make sure you go to our website, uh, to the boundary page, and you're able to click on the survey there and to be able to access everything that uh, the individuals here in person are able to see. So now what I would ask everyone to do is to be able to, we have some stations here, but mainly most of the boards are going to be out this direction. But we have a lot of staff members who will be able to greet you and bring you into the large poster boards to be able to see all the different concepts, elementary, middle, and high school, concept one, and concept two. The board members, administration will be floating around answering any questions out there. So if we can start to move out to the uh, boundary maps, I would appreciate it. Thank you all.